So in the next chapter of Eco Resolutions Learning Journey, we are exploring nonviolent direct action or the role of social movements and direct action in systemic change. We're joined by Lawrence Cox, who's written extensively on engaged and participatory approaches to movement research, on Marxism and social movement studies, on ecology movements, European traditions of theorizing movements, and on social movements in Ireland, notably working class community activism and global justice struggles. His books include Why Social Movements Matter, we Make Our Own History, Marxism and Social Movement in the Twilight of Neoliberalism. And this year, a new book, The Irish Buddhist, The Forgotten Monk Who Faced Down the British Empire. So thank you so much for joining us, Lawrence. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Thanks for having me. Great. Is there anything you'd like to add to the introduction? Anything in this? No, that's rather embarrassing. <laughs> embarrassing? Actually, no, I, I will say I do social movements. I've been involved in movements since before I started researching and writing about them. So that's fundamentally where I'm coming from. That might be worth saying. So you're not just an academic? I train activists uh, and I write for activists. Amazing. And when you say you do social movements, what does that mean? Um, I suppose that when there's something there that needs action taking, uh, I try and be available, get involved, see what's a helpful thing that I can do, because you can think about social movements as this very scary thing, or activism or protest is maybe something you've seen on the news. Uh, but it's not about doing something glamorous or dramatic or scary. It's about seeing what's actually needed right now, which might be sharing a message, going along to an event, helping to collect money. Could be very, very mundane things, reaching out to somebody who needs a bit of support. Mm. And, and how would you define a social movement? What, what is a social movement? You said earlier just now, um, doing things that need doing. So... Look, when there's a really big problem like climate change and people have been aware of that problem for a while, it doesn't really make sense to carry on with the thought, oh, if only people knew about this. Yeah. We've known about this problem for decades. So you see then that the problem is not that governments don't know, it's not that corporations don't know, it's that they don't want to know. And in many cases, we find they've been actively trying to deny it. So if that's the case, we can't just be looking to them to sort out a problem that they are clearly happy with. It's not that they're happy about climate change per se, but they're happy, for example, about rampant fossil fuel use. They want that to continue. They actively want that to continue. So if we're going to challenge that, it's going to have to come not from the powerful, not from wealthy people. Um, it's going to be lots and lots of ordinary people saying, no, actually, we have to change this. Mm. So that's a rough working definition of social movements. It's trying to change things or prevent something disastrous when you're not relying on power, you're not relying on wealth, you're not relying on being a privileged group of people. You're relying on yourselves, uh, and your allies. Mm. Yeah, because I think often the, the powers that be or the system may seem like it's there for a reason to keep us safe <laughs> or because it's the status quo and so therefore it's somehow just or right. Um, but I love this idea that the power flows upwards. So it's kind of a democratic way of viewing power by seeing that um, a system or an authority is only in place yeah because of everything that's happened before it. So all that yes. cooperation of all those many other layers. Um, yeah, and so, so what is the role of direct action, would you say, within social movements or within the breaking down of those layers and transforming them? So, fundamentally, you don't get big change just by asking for it. So you said a second back, well, power flows upwards. This is literally true. Most people in the world live in countries that became independent from empires 
within living memory. And they didn't get independence by politely asking for it. Yeah. Uh, in most countries in the world, universal suffrage, again, wasn't just given. Yeah. Kings and dictators and so on don't just say, oh, here you go, I'm going to abdicate. Yeah. Have a democracy. Men didn't just step back and say, oh, women should have the right to vote. And this is true for so many things. It's true for LGBTQ rights. It's true for the environmental protections we do have. It's true for basic elements of welfare states. So provision of education, provision of healthcare or whatever. These things aren't given, they're taken. So direct action is the process of taking them, of pushing for them, of stepping outside the usual channels because the usual channels are just going to give us the stuff we can get anyway, without really upsetting people. Mm. And it's interesting when you look back historically, if you look back at the kind of, mm. especially the history that we study in schools, it's kind of a history of waves of struggle, yeah. protest, transformation, then decay, and then again, waves of change. And do you think that's just, how humans are that's the social groups learning to live together struggling together but ultimately we're always always doomed or, or do you think that we will one day achieve liberation and be free of all of that, <laughs> <laughs> or do you think that, that these these waves are just part of learning to be together like, how, how do you understand that well um i think in the big picture over, say, 250 years, things are definitely getting better. So if you go back to the French Revolution, the idea of people who opposed that was peasants should just get back in their box. Peasants should not have any say in anything that goes on. That's up to us. Yeah? The monarch ruling by divine right, maybe the nobility, the clergy advising on what God wants, but that's it. Yeah. We're well past that now. Yeah. We're well past the idea that you should only have the things that you could personally, privately pay for. Yeah. And we see that around the virus. Yeah. Nobody seriously disagrees that the state should be looking out for everybody. It shouldn't just be trying to protect the rich. Then we argue about whether the state is actually making an effort, uh, whether it's doing it well or whatever. But we actually sit within that framework. We agree fundamentally, bar a few utter lunatics, that public health is a shared issue. So, yeah, you know, we, we do push things. Uh, and even the people who want to just keep on burning oil and gas, they're not pretending, oh, we just have a right to do that and never mind the consequences, they're pretending there aren't any consequences. Yeah. So they're well aware that they have to answer to the rest of us for the way the planet's going. Mm. Yes, ultimately a dialogue is it between those in power and those who are creating change, and then when those who create change are coming into power, like how do we respond and still become accountable to the many instead of to ourselves or to our ideas of what, what would work in this given circumstance? Um, yeah, and every so often, you know, we think we've won something and we go, oh, okay, that's fine. We've got that, it's sorted. Yeah. So, you know, it was perfectly reasonable 150 years ago to think, well, if all adult men have the vote, then we'll just redistribute the wealth, won't we? And inequality will cease to be. Or if we become independent from empires, that'll sort things. Or if women get the vote, there won't be any gender inequality. So you push things up, you know, you push that rock up to the top of the mountain, you let it roll down the other side, and then you go, actually, there's still some problems here. We're going to have to come out again. Yeah. There's a new set of things. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, that's okay. It's not such a terrible thing to do, to stand up and say the world should be a better place. Yeah. yeah. No. And, and I think it's that role of vision as well that can bring many people together with different, have differences um, hmm. and 
And it's really important to kind of have that vision that gives you your direction and your sense of purpose, yeah. belonging and self-belief. And it's ultimately that that can really catalyze transformation. Mm. Um, I'm really inspired by different social movements that can come together above and beyond like difference, yeah. political difference. And um, yeah, like the move, social movement of the Via Campesina, um, mm -hmm. which is the group of many different um, peasant farming organizations from like, I think 80, more than 80 countries around the world. Um, and when it comes to like social movements, how, how can we ensure that this diversity is celebrated um, and which ultimately I think will ensure the eff eff effectiveness of it? Um, mm. Well, look, we need that diversity, right? So, um, the phrase climate justice points to this. And it comes from an earlier phrase, environmental justice. Um, and the idea there is if we don't have big social majorities supporting the need for a sustainable ecology, we're not going to get there. If it's just a lifestyle thing for people who are privileged, and then we're not going to win. We're not going to win against the big fossil fuel corporations, the governments agribusiness, the big transport industries, and so on and so forth. If we want to win, we need other people on our side. Yeah? So the, the struggle for ecological change has got to go along with a struggle for social justice. Yeah? So um, an example that I've looked at is in Nigeria, actually, uh, in the Niger Delta, uh, the movement of the Ogoni people against Shell uh, in the 1990s, but which is still going today. And the Ogoni are among the poorest people in the world. Yeah. Literally, I was talking to somebody working in the foundation there who said, we don't actually know quite how many people there are, which tells you something about how remote and rural and poor it is. But they were able to win against Shell to win against what was then a military dictatorship because the struggle was not only an environmental one, it also connected with their need for social justice, for human rights, for recognition as a people and so on. Now that's different if it's Native American populations or First Nations in Canada fighting pipelines, for example, but it's the same kind of issue. It's the same kind of issue in our own countries. That's what the phrase Green New Deal, which is interpreted in many different ways, means. Is look, we need to offer jobs, we need to offer social progress, not just uh, an environmental improvement. Because mm. people are so much on the edge, we have to build alliances of different movements. Yeah. Yeah, that is that's like the movement of movements as well, though, isn't it? Mm, yeah. like bringing bringing people together above difference, and uniting around an ideal, and is that is that is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I want to say, sometimes we talk about that as though it's a cost, and it's true. Often you have to say the kind of thing I've just said to kind of talk people into it, but actually, it's also about us growing as human beings. Because sure, you know, when we're in our teens, our early 20s, maybe we mostly want to be with people like us because we're busy working out who we are. But once you're comfortable in that, you actually start to realise that you're growing by spending more time with people who aren't like you and with people whose lives are very different. And not saying to them, oh, I want you to be like me or feeling guilty because our lives aren't like theirs but just actually appreciating each other. And some of the best moments that I've had are precisely spending longer periods of time with people that I would never you know, have been able to engage with as peers otherwise. But there we are, we're working on the same thing from our very, very different perspectives. And that's brilliant. Mm. You can't buy that. <laughs> you literally cannot buy that. So it's this kind of interlinking of environmental um, movement, social movement and social justice, and also um, more spiritual ideals, I suppose, as well, like ideals of 
how we live, how we bring together in, in our now to change. Um, I think it's interesting that your second field of research is um, Buddhism. Um, and, and how do you see that that relates to social movements and the work that you do there? Well, so here's the thing. We can often imagine that we are just in this little kind of tiny private bubble. And it's just me and my mates and my family and my job and a very, very little circle around that. And everything else outside, we just encounter it through the telly or whatever, whatever. But that's not actually true. Yeah? So from a Buddhist perspective, we're already connected. We're already part of an ecosystem. We're already part of a society. Mm. The clothes we wear, you know, the phones we use, they connect us with people on the other side of the world in all sorts of ways, yeah? really upsetting ways, sometimes really positive ways as well. But that belief that we're in this little private bubble means that we're not really seeing that. So we have these connections, but they're unconscious, they're habitual, yeah? we're not owning them. So from a Buddhist perspective, actually seeing those connections firstly, and then coming to say, well, what can I do positively about that? How can I connect, for example, with, you know, women workers somewhere in the Philippines or Mexico or China or whatever, who are getting sexually harassed in their workplaces, which are making things that are sold where I am? What can I do to help? How can we build a link? And then we're inhabiting that relationship differently. Mm. Or, you know, the people in the Niger Delta I was talking about. Shell turned up a few years after that in Ireland. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And, wow, well, there was an instant connection. And, of course, there were Shell petrol stations all around the country at that point. Eventually, they had to sell up and get out. Wow. So, you see, we're already connected. But yeah. social movements help you to see and inhabit that connection in a positive and creative way, rather than just kind of sailing through it as though it's not there, not really seeing, not really seeing your own life, really. Mm. Your life is something that happens to you. Yeah. I suppose it's a more ecological understanding, isn't it? Seeing, seeing the depth, the interconnection, how we're all related and fundamentally transforming how we see ourselves as an actor in relationship. Yeah to change and in relationship to other beings, human and non-human, that are within, within the system, which is within living, like the living world. Um, yeah. Uh, it makes me think a little bit about that saying of um, when vivid, which I think you've written about as well, or, and, and this kind of concept of um, like, how we can create sustainable and inclusive futures based and presence based on this concept of good living. Um, and I wonder how that relates to this concept of interconnectivity um, and relationship. Well, a friend of mine who was uh, an anthropologist, spent time in Australia, came back from there and said, well, you know, white Australians tend to look down on Aboriginals, but Aboriginals have actually been living there in the heart of the desert for 40,000 years. This was what they thought at the time. They've actually pushed it back even further. But 40,000 years was the phrase back then. So if we want to ask which of those two societies is still going to be going, even in another thousand years, is it white Australia or is it um, those traditional Aboriginal ways of living in a context of climate change, you'd bet on the Aboriginal way of living. Because it's already survived so much. Yeah. It's already capable of living in these extraordinarily extreme environments. Mm. But that's a challenge for us if we live in these hyper-industrialised worlds where we don't really know where our food comes from. We don't really know where our energy comes from. We've got very few practical skills. So we need to think 
that little bit harder because it's not so immediately obvious. Now, in any indigenous society, people pay a lot of attention to the elders because the elders have some understanding and memory of how do we survive? What did we do last time this kind of thing happened? Where can we go to in extreme difficulty? We're encouraged just to consume, and that means also just to be, again, very passive mm. and ignorant of the context we're in. So for a lot of people, little things like, say, starting to think about where their food comes from, starting to get involved in producing a bit of food themselves in some kind of consumer co-op or whatever, you start to inform yourself, well, what's growable locally? Mm. Yeah. This island we're on, this, this wet place, yeah, speaking from Ireland, how, how have people lived in it? How did they live in it 200 years back? How did they live in it a few thousand years back? What might be possible in the future? So at that very, very basic level, to become, in a sense, a little bit more adult, so without being too pejorative, just a bit more mature, to go, yeah, you know, this is, this is what makes it possible for me to exist here in this place. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose this system, um, current system, is functions through separation, and whether it's, family community separation because we're sold this ideal of like a nuclear family uh, mm. that has a mortgage that has a debt and that has a job and it pays has a job yeah. to pay its mortgage and it has a nanny to look after the children who, and and and, it, and, and it, so on and so forth yeah and it, and it functions in this web of separation um mm. so these little nuclear pockets or whether it's um global trade like even, even though globalization sells or digitalization sells an image of connection, it's ultimately connection that's only ever to the service of like an economic functioning, which ultimately relies on separation. So, so it's a very, it's a very um, strange reality, I think, that we live in of almost Trojan horses. <laughs> and and how, how can we come back to this much deeper connect, much real, greater sense of connection that is more ecological, that celebrates the spiritual, that celebrates community, um, the relationship of well-being to the whole, um, more like circularity. You mentioned before the ancestors, like thinking about the relationship with the ancestors, but also the relationship with future generations, like there's the seven generations, which I think is another indigenous mm. concept. Um, and kind of coming back to these indigenous ideas, but without um, traditional ideas, but without a sense of appropriation. Um, and also, like how it's all good and well criticizing that, but for many people, that's most of us now, that's how we um, live. And that's what allows us to have a good life in, in, to, some, to some degree. Um, so, and by creating mass transformation in, in that regard will also cause a lot of suffering. Um, and that relationship is quite a tricky one. Like I think a lot of the Marxist theory is often criticized for the suffering that that might bring in its wake at a, at, at a short term, short level. And how, how do we go about that conflict, that tension? I think we try and move away from an image to something a bit more practical. So that sort of good life image that you were telling us about previously, you know, the way we're supposed to live, there can definitely be you know, an ecological, spiritual, radical version of that, where you go, oh, okay, I'm going to replace that with a different image. And I'm going to try and live up to this new image. And it, it's maybe equally disconnected from who we are, from where we are. It's another arbitrary thing, but, you know, maybe we've started consuming different media and that media has told us, oh, be like this, not like that. So that's not great. Uh, and as you say, we're not um, Aboriginals. We're not Native Americans. We are where we are 
you know. So here in Dublin, it's got its own history, its own place, and it, you know, it takes a bit of time to kind of think about that and think, well, what maybe is a livable future for Dublin? And if you want to bring that about, you know, like this idea of um, environmental justice, if you want to bring about a better place to be, you have to bring other people with you. Mm. You have to start finding out, well, what are other people already doing? Okay, how can we, you know, how can I connect in with that? Do I want to be part of something that's already going on? Do I feel there's something that needs doing that nobody else is really seeing yet? Uh, maybe there's quite a lot of alternative food groups going on, but I really want to do something around education, for example. Or maybe a lot of people are campaigning on transport, and I really feel passionate about that. So you're connecting with other people, because what you're looking for in any movement is a lot of other people and a lot of other people's needs. You know, at the bottom of any movement is a need that's not being met. So it's not about trying to bring about some fantastic idea, either some fantastic idea of who we want to be or some beautiful picture of the future. It's about starting to go a bit more clearly, well, what are my needs? What are the things that I really feel deeply about? What sets me on fire? Okay, what can I do about that? And then also seeing where are other people in that? Okay, how do, how do we work together? How do we make connections? Yeah, yeah I love that theme keeps coming up. How do we make connections? Mm. Um, you spoke a bit before about um, it's not an image, but images and art have also got a big drill going on in the street outside. <laughs> <laughs> um, images and art have also played, or often played, especially in the last century, a huge role in... Um, bringing attention to and also galvanizing people around an ideal of change, like especially during the 1960s, whether it was in Paris before the 1968 sure. or the Cuban revolution. And um, that role of creativity in social movements, I think is gonna, and art in social movements, is becoming increasingly apparent even now again with um, Black Lives Matter and also Extinction Rebellion. Um, there's certain like artistic, and creative methodologies that are being used often. Um, do you see art as playing a crucial role in social change? Well, yeah, I mean, look, it could be art, it could be spirituality, it could be a bit vaguer than that, but people's sense of what do I want this world to be like? So, yeah, if you think of Black Lives Matter in the States at the moment, the big demand is actually abolishing the police. Yeah. is saying, look, American police forces, they are irredeemably racist. They routinely, frequently and regularly kill black people. And actually, that's how it's been for a couple of hundred years. There's no way of reforming this. So that's a vision. Yeah? Uh, it's not a very beautiful vision because it's a vision that's shaped by so many deaths, so much trauma, so much fear having to bring up your children, uh, particularly your sons, to go, listen, if you've got an encounter with cops, do this, don't do that. Whatever you do, don't say this, those kinds of things. Uh, and sometimes it's more beautiful, sometimes it's more spiritual, but always what it's like is it's something that's distant enough that it gives you the force to break through the present. Because you can see right now, for example, Joe Biden or the Democratic mayors of cities like Portland, they're going nowhere near that. Yeah. They have no interest. And in fact, a lot of the major BLM cities are run by Democrats. So it's quite a long term future vision. It's the thing that gives you the energy to deal with all the grief that's here right now. And of course, in the States, that's a huge amount of grief. So you know this idea, I don't know if it's really true in karate and so on, but that to uh, sort of chop through the brick, you imagine your hand at a point on the other side of the brick, um, rather than simply thinking about the brick and hitting the brick. Something a bit like that, yeah? 
So to get to the point of LGBT rights, to get to the point of ending apartheid, people had to have these visions of what the future was going to be, political visions, artistic visions, religious visions. And maybe when you get through to the other side of the brick, what's on the other side of the wall looks a bit different to what you thought it would. You know, of course it does. It's the future. But you do need that very often to deal with the present and to go, it's not just about what is manageable here and now. So, you know, similarly, in many, many countries right now, whether it's you know, England, Turkey, Brazil, India, or whatever, you could look at your government and go, we have no hope. Yeah? We can get so little stuff. Yeah? We really can't win anything significant. We've got to lower our expectations so much. And sometimes people do that. They just really narrow it down to the thing that they think this or that minister might make a little concession around or a tiny project. Um, if you want big change, though, you've got to see beyond that. You've got to see beyond you know, the immediate shower of crooks or loons or thugs that you've got in power and go, no, actually, there's a bigger picture here. And try and make that real for you. Mm. It's, it's interesting looking historically as well, how in the past there's often social movements linked specifically to another future potential leader or mm -hmm. um, power structure that would then be put into place. Mm -hmm. I feel like now there's a big movement towards civil resistance and decentralization where the power yeah. remains in the hands of the people and there isn't often an uh, alternative figurehead being put in place and I wonder if this is um, just a changing concept of social change or uh, how society may work in the future and um, I wonder if it's linked to um, globalization um, or the like internet age. Um, I, have you thought about that? Yes. Yeah, so, look in in the middle of the last century, nation states were where it was at. If you wanted to bring about change, you got a state of your own, be it through independence, be it through getting rid of the previous king or whatever. And the state was also really central for economic development. It was central for building welfare states. Uh, so that idea of we've got to take over the state and then very often as well, well, we need a leadership, we need a figurehead, somebody like the previous kings, the previous dictators or whatever, that's where we're going. And it also went together with often a much more disempowered, poorly educated, desperate population. We're in a different situation now for all sorts of reasons. Um, notably, the idea that, oh no, if we just took hold of the state, you know, if this one election went the way we wanted, everything would be different. It's harder to believe that these days. But also, you know, you were saying earlier about some of the disappointments of Marxism, and we've seen disappointments for every movement. Yeah. So we got the right to vote, or we got a whole series of women's rights, LGBTQ rights, we saw the end of apartheid, we saw the end of dictatorships, we got free education or whatever it might be. And these were all steps forward, don't get me wrong. But they also weren't as great. They didn't bring everything that people had imagined they would. And very often then as well, you see that some of the people who'd surfed to power on that, they weren't so great either. Yeah? So no sane person would say we should go back to apartheid. Mm. South African government is grim. It's really grim. Yeah. So then a new generation has got to challenge that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one thing that's really important here, not just with that kind of politics, but also with NGOs, with groups like Extinction Rebellion, it doesn't really matter who, is the tendency to tell people there is this one weird trick. There is this one way to bring about social change and we're gonna offer it to you. So join us, become our members, be on our social media feed, whatever it is, 
we're going to teach you to do this one thing in this one way and it will work and it will work in all circumstances and it will always be fantastic. So decentralization and diversity are a huge strength because they get away from that. And they mean that together in our different groups, our different campaigns, the alliances that make up a really big movement or a movement of movements, we can watch each other, we can see what's working, we can see what's going which way in different countries as well, or around different issues. And we can go, ah, oh, you know, that thing right now, that thing that they've just done, be it Black Lives Matter, be it Standing Rock, or whatever, that's really inspirational. Hey, what can we learn from that? Yeah. Can we bring somebody over? Can we talk to them a bit more about it? So decentralization is a big strength because it means we're not just relying on a handful of leaders saying, here's our cool plan for the future. Yeah. Multiplicity, diversity, decentralization, interconnection, the same yeah. themes keep coming up. Um, <laughs> I just want to come to talk a little bit about the context of coronavirus that we find ourselves in and ignoring the drill. <laughs> it's like the constant buzz on the back of everybody's mind is the coronavirus. Um, sure, like, yeah. um, because I was thinking how this year, for the first time, um, globally, there's been pretty much a ban on gatherings. It hasn't obviously, on, on mass gatherings, it hasn't obviously worked. There's been huge social up, un, um, unrest and uprising, particularly with Black Lives Matter. Um, but last year, in 2019, um, there were uprising globally in so many different cities. Um, like, I just brought up a list of them. Um, there's Paris, La Paz, Prague, Port-au-Prince, Beirut, Bogota, Berlin, Catalonia, Cairo, Hong Kong, Harare, Santiago, Sydney, Seoul, Quito, Jakarta, Tehran, Algeria, Baghdad, Budapest, London, New Delhi, Manila, and Moscow. I mean, the, and they were all quite significant. Right. Like those, that list, hmm. I mean, they're not, they weren't small, those protests. No, no. Like the one you in the put past. a beat behind that. Yeah. <laughs> like it was a, they were, they were, they were, they were very hmm. big, important, significant protests that we all heard about in, in every newspaper hmm. across the world. Um, and then this year, it was all pretty much brought to a standstill. Hmm. Um, what do you see as the long-term impact of the ban on um, civil uprising, mass gathering? Um, and how do you see that as a threat to social change? Mm, I'm not that worried. Yeah. So the powers that be have always been bothered by you know, uppity plebs challenging them. And they've always tried to find a way of, you know, so literally sometimes rebuilding cities or trying to ban social media or whatever, whatever. Sometimes it's a problem, but it never actually works long term. Yeah. It's just a thing that they do. So um, I run an activist journal, it's called Interface. And when the virus hit, we put out a call and said, look, wherever you are around the world, tell us what people are doing in your movements right now. Yeah. Tell us how it's going for you. And it was extraordinary. And so we had queer activists in Singapore. We had people who were helping migrants in the Western Balkans. We had people who were doing mutual aid in the States. This was all before Black Lives Matter restarted, before the big Hong Kong protests as well. And you just saw all around the world, yeah, people were sometimes readjusting, either because of clampdowns on gatherings or um, because there were new kinds of needs. People desperately needed mutual aid when the state was completely failing them. But people just kept going. You know, very, very few people said, ah, you know what, we just shut up shop, we went home. You know, they told us we couldn't do X, so we gave up. You know, and if you think about it, you know, if you think of any secondary school, yeah, if teacher comes along and says, you're not allowed to do this, you know, one or two people might go, oh, we're not allowed to do this, maybe we should just go back to class. But most other people are going to go, okay, they just said we're not allowed to do this. What are we going to do? Yeah. 
teenagers do that, yeah? It's not a very difficult calculation. And in fact, what results we have, the research we've seen so far, suggests that none of the big um, progressive protests have seen any spike in infections because they've been well organized, yeah? because people are not in the business of trying to infect each other. Now, that's a bit different for the far right rallies where people jam in together, they don't wear masks, they all like shouting and so on. Yeah, yeah that's Darwinian. But you know, all it really means is, okay, we've got to think a bit differently about how we organize things. And yeah, we can do that. We do it all the time, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. And, and is there any examples of social movements um, that you recommend us learning more about or looking to for inspiration? Lots of them. Lots of different <laughs> ones. Maybe, maybe current ones. Sorry? Maybe current ones. Current ones. I think some of the most interesting movements at the moment when we're concerned about climate change and ecological issues are the indigenous direct action protests. So for example, right now, the protests in Canada and British Columbia, because you're talking about populations who are desperately poor, they are very low cultural status, whatever, the rest of the world might think about them, but where they are, they're on the receiving end of so much racism, so much police violence, and often they are acting in tiny numbers in extreme remote environments. Yeah, so the Canadian people who were resisting really in the middle of the snow, these kind of paramilitary responses from the mountains. And when you see how effective that is, it really makes you stop and think. So it makes you think again about this question of climate justice, yeah? about where are the non-privileged populations, the non-wealthy, the non-powerful populations whose struggles connect up with other environmental ones. And it also makes you think about direct action because you see that when people are genuinely willing to put their bodies on the line, it's hugely effective. And it can be hugely effective even in small numbers. But then you look at what that really means, yeah, because direct action can be used to mean a lot of things. And you see these are not photo ops. Yeah? This is not getting arrested as a stunt. This is actively and seriously trying to blockade the building of a pipeline to transport uh, fossil fuel products. Uh, that's actively what it's about. So then you think, okay, well, I'm not near a pipeline, but are there other ways in which I can actively disrupt this process? Are there other things that I can do? Yeah. So in some ways, the advantage of it not being our situation is we can't go, yeah, let's all be First Nations and live in a hut in the woods which is part of what they've been doing. But we can go, what might that mean where I am? What's a reasonable, sensible thing for me to do? And to think about that. And to see you do not have to be famous, wealthy, or anything like that to actually have an effect. A very small number of very poor and normally powerless people can have a huge impact. And maybe also give them some solidarity. You know? amplify them on social media, send some money to the legal funds if they need it. Yes, yeah, solidarity and also um, action here for the, similar, for the same, well, wherever you find yourself for, for the similar. Yeah. Um, something in the UK that's inspiring is the HS2 groups who are tying themselves to the trees to the bitter end against insurmountable um, political and in um, economic clout, which clearly isn't going to bow down to the, to the activists. But the fact that they keep going and the issue is still at the heart of a lot of act, like UK-based activism um, is, is hugely inspiring. 
Um, and I wonder, like, if you find yourself in these situations, like, how can we ensure that our activism is sustainable and that we don't burn out? Yeah, because it can get very hard. So particularly if it becomes a full-time activity, if you're subject to a lot of repression, if people around you really don't get it, why are you doing this? Why are you making life hard for yourself? Why are you doing something weird? So we do need to look after each other, absolutely. And uh, I, so I work with, uh, you know them as well, the ULEX project in Catalonia, who are very, very good on this stuff on giving people the tools they need to keep going, to nourish themselves, for activism not to be this you know, awful effort against huge odds, uh, but to be something actually enjoyable. And to deal with trauma if it comes, because sometimes trauma does come, yeah. Now, I want to say, look, grief happens in our lives anyway. Yeah? We don't have to go very far to get trouble. It's not true to say, if only I stayed at home, my life would be fine. Yeah. And the virus has really brought this home to us. There isn't you know, a safe place, but we can choose what kinds of threats and risks we expose ourselves to. Um, I'd say two things. One thing is I think it's really important to know ourselves. So to see what am I like? What are the things that I'm really good at? What are the spaces I'm comfortable in? Where am I willing to push myself a bit? What's a space that simply makes no sense for me? Yeah. And to push ourselves a bit, by all means, don't, but don't put yourself under the kind of emotional pressure where you go, unless I go and do X, I'm a worthless human being. So, Back in the days uh, in Italy, let's say, in the resistance against the Nazis at the end of the Second World War, they had partisans up in the mountains, right, uh, directly resisting the Nazis. And there was a huge thing about the partisans, but it took 25 other people to keep each one person up in the mountains. Yeah, People were passing out leaflets, secretly putting up posters, getting food to them, collecting money, trans transmitting information or whatever. So 25 supporters for each one person doing the really dramatic high stakes stuff. So it's totally legit to think, where am I best suited? What am I really good at? You know, can I bring my parent teacher group along with me to do something, for example, to support the student strikes when they start up again? You know, that might actually be a, pushing yourself quite a bit because, you know, the other parents could be quite a big deal. So that's one thing, is to have a clear sense of self. The thing, absolutely, to find out what is it that nourishes you. And that's very different for different people. So there's a great piece of research about Latin American women defending human rights. And because they were Latin American women, uh, religion was huge, the family was huge, food and music was huge. Now, some of that might resonate with us, some of that might not. Yeah, so it's really going, well, you know, for me, is it maybe time in nature? Or is it my art, for example? What is it that calms me down, that helps me feel more connected, that nourishes me and regenerates me? So, it is quite personal and it is, you know, about knowing ourselves that bit better, really. Slow process. Mm. Like nourishment, joy, community, solidarity, mm. um, all things that don't always fit in the picture of an activist, when especially yeah. like the stereotype of an activist is somebody angry, mm. um, frustrated, mm. uh, aggressive, violent. Um, yeah. But in reality, an activist is somebody who loves life and who yeah. wants to fight to protect it and who loves community and wants to fight to and wants to work to protect it. Um, and, and I think by changing our understanding of what is an activist to be a much polar, um, more, um, more complete um, understanding of activism, 
will really enable our movements to be like nourishing, also sustainable and, regen and regenerative in the long term. Our movements have got to be welcoming spaces for very different types of people. Yeah, for people of different ages, different generations, people with different kinds of bodies, neurodiverse people, and you know, for all the diversity of gender, race, class, sexuality, and so on and so forth. You know, because otherwise it's just a lifestyle activity. It's just a little niche group of me and people like me doing a thing, yeah. which is where that stereotype comes from. You know, is you imagine over here there are people who like embroidery, and over here there are people who like shouting through megaphones, and somehow these are you know little lifestyle groups. You know, and if we think like that, we've already lost. Yeah, we really have. But when when a movement is big, you see grannies involved. Yeah, you see parents coming along with buggies. Yeah. You see posters up in your corner shop, yeah? You know, where you normally wouldn't say anything other than, oh, looks like it might rain today or whatever. And you notice lots of people who are kind of on the fringes of your attention. They're not part of your circle, but they're in there. And then you go, oh, we're doing something here. You know, we might be about to win here. It's not just people I know. It's not just people like people I know. Yeah, because if a, if a movement is made up of people who are the same, it's not a movement at all, is it? Like, exactly. It's never going to create yeah. change. Hmm. Just replace one power structure with another. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, think, I think we should wrap up now because um, yeah. we're coming to the end. And um, just wanted to say a huge thank you, Lawrence. Um, it's been an amazing, fascinating conversation looking at the history of social movements, but also regenerative approaches to social change, like how we can celebrate diversity, how we can move towards the role of decentralization, um, interconnectivity, um, and the relationship between inner and outer transformation. And I just wonder if we are to go our separate ways now, do you have a final message for our audience? Something you'd like to tell them? <laughs> Basically, it's okay, yeah? It's okay to be who we are and just kind of move one or two steps in the direction of changing things. But also, it's okay to deal with problems of this scale, like climate change, yeah? because we get it presented to us by mainstream media or whatever, who love scaring us and have no interest in big movements challenging the causes of that. But we've dealt with bigger problems before, yeah? You know, we've dealt with a continent dominated by Nazism. Yeah? We've dealt with massive, massive, unbelievable levels of poverty. We faced down nuclear power in many countries. We've won so many different things over the years, yeah? We can absolutely do this, yeah? It will be okay. We're, ca we're well capable <laughs> with this challenge. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah.